we explore how the Queen has managed some of her greatest trials and tribulations. Anything that could go wrong, did go wrong. It was like slap, slap, slap across the face of the royal family. From scandal and disaster... The flames seem to be 200 feet high. She's standing there, this small figure in a raincoat. You could see it in her face. The emotion was palpable. To tragedy and murder... My brother and I were at the castle, and we actually heard the bomb go off. We were to smithereens. Of course, there was nothing left. And find out what it takes to be queen when your family and the nation are tested to the limit. She is. She's getting out of the car. Nobody knew what the reaction was going to be. It was a very dangerous time for the royal family. Being queen, being monarch. Grenfell Tower, June 2017. The worst residential fire in the UK since World War II. 72 people were killed. Dozens more were injured. As survivors struggled to cope, politicians became the target of public anger. I was down there at the time. Tempers were a breaking point. I remember standing in the crowd at the sports hall just under the A40. And suddenly this, oh, silence. Here was the Queen. It's an appalling sight, she said, after hearing about the flames. But she has clearly noticed how this community has pulled together to help. She was talking to people without any of the protocol and sort of people surrounding her. It was just the Queen. Defusing some of the anger and some of the emotion. I think when you have some colossal tragedy or national shock, all the usual responses are there. Anger, incomprehension. And the Queen somehow rises above that. When she appears, it's a different mood. There she is, looking strong, smiling, giving comfort. And that's what the Queen does at times of national tragedy. Just three weeks before Grenfell, the Queen had gone to Manchester in the wake of the concert bombing. Throughout Manchester's Children's Hospital, there was a ripple of excitement when news spread this morning of the Queen's unexpected arrival here. The royal family in general, the Queen in particular, are meant to act as national conduits of feeling. So when the Queen turns up at the site of the Manchester bomb bombings at Grenfell Tower, it is as if the whole nation is showing their sympathy. And that, perhaps, is their function. What the Queen called a wicked act had, she said, brought this city together. Very interesting how everybody has united, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, it's been amazing. I think the thing with the Queen is that she's always herself. She's not some actress putting on a part. So she's going there because she feels it's her duty to be there. It's a hard road to tread between, on the one hand, being stoical, being brave. You had enjoyed the concert, presumably. Yeah, it was really good. Was it? And on the other, showing that they feel, and perhaps the balance has swung over the Queen's reign. I got to meet her at the concert as well. She was lovely. Really? Yeah. Perhaps at first it was more about showing courage, steadfastness. Now it's a little more about showing feeling. But the important thing is just for the Queen to be there. It's almost like as the mother of the nation, as she is supposed to be, you just want mummy to be there in times of national trouble. By rushing to Grenfell and Manchester immediately after those disasters, the Queen got the mood of the nation right. But 50 years earlier, her judgment was not as sure. On the 21st of October 1966, a slag heap collapsed upon the South Wales mining village of Abervan, engulfing the local primary school. The school lay in the direct path of the disintegrating man-made mountain.
144 people were killed, 116 of them children. Their children were buried in that mud. Mud almost filled the classrooms. With shovels, if necessary, with bare hands, they pitted themselves against the uncounted tons of slimy filth. Aberfan was one of the first great national disasters that the Queen had to handle. She issued a statement expressing her condolences, but rather than going straight to the scene, she waited and sent Prince Philip instead. The reason that she gave for this delay was that she thought that if she was there, she would attract attention when people should be dealing with their grief, and that's what she wanted to avoid. She said that she was terrified that all the fuss that would accompany her visit might mean, God forbid, that some child was missed in the wreckage. But it was misunderstood. A lot of people were incredibly critical. The monarchy doesn't care, etc. It was a huge national tragedy, and still the Queen did not show up. But now, Daily Mail journalist Robert Hardman believes there was another little-known reason the Queen didn't rush to the scene. What everyone I've spoken to about it says is that the Queen was really worried that she would let the side down. She didn't want to go there and make things worse for these families. She was a young mother. Prince Edward was a baby and she knew she was going to be as overwhelmed as everybody else was. And the last thing people want is a sobbing queen crying on their shoulder. The tragedy of Aberfan presented a dilemma for the queen as leader of the nation. How much of yourself do you show when you are confronted with death, with trauma, with a disaster? Of course, you don't want to be seen as apathetic, but also we don't want to see the queen collapse, unable to cope, overcome with emotion at times when we are looking to her to keep the nation together. Finally, eight days after the tragedy and under mounting criticism, the Queen made the journey to Aberfan to pay her respects. When eventually she did go at the end of the week, you could see she was genuinely moved by the tragedy of it. When she actually arrived, she spoke with families. There was one woman who'd lost seven members of her family, and the Queen just sat with her, quietly, saying nothing for half an hour. That was the Queen showing her humanity. The occasions when you see the Queen display her grief, those occasions are very few and far between but you really do see that emotion in her face. She saved the situation, and I think the lesson was that it's really important to make an instant appearance and not to wait. The Queen learned from her mistake at Aberfan. Over the past 50 years, she's worked hard to make up for it, returning to the village four times to meet bereaved families. I think if you ask anyone who's worked with the Queen a long time to name her regrets, one that usually pops up is Abba Fan. The Queen said that she has to be seen to be believed. It's one of her favourite mottos, but she has also to be seen to feel, to care. But 13 years after Aberfan, the Queen would again be tested by tragedy, and this time it would strike at the heart of her own family. The bomb was placed in the decking just under here. We saw the police rush back. There was utter mayhem. Winter 2019, Britain is bitterly divided by the Brexit crisis. On the 24th of January, the Queen makes a telling speech.
to the Sandringham branch of the Women's Institute that's read as an allusion to Brexit. She talks of the importance of respecting the other person's point of view, seeking out common ground and never losing sight of the bigger picture. This is the stuff of what being a sovereign is, uniting rather than dividing. It'd be very interesting to know what the Queen thought about Brexit. But she has transcended all that. The monarchy should be a unifying factor. People up and down the country admire her. Even Republicans admire her. They may dislike the principle, but they cannot fault the woman. She is all things to all man. And that really works. In a divided country, it often falls to the monarch to lead the work of reconciliation. But some of the most painful conflicts the Queen has had to deal with have been within her own family. It is fitting that here the present Queen should meet the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. He is her uncle. And when he gave up the throne, Princess Elizabeth was a girl only 10 years old. In 1972, the Queen would attempt to make peace with the man who nearly brought down the monarchy. The vendetta had been incredibly long-lived, bitter, horrible, and the Queen Mother had been utterly unforgiving. The Queen's mission would coincide with a state visit to France as Britain prepared to join the EEC the following year. In the National Archives at Kew, Royal biographer Robert Hardman has uncovered some remarkable documents revealing the planning of the trip. Here is this very, very important state visit. Today we go on about Brexit, but what we're looking at here is effectively Brentry. This is Britain going into Europe with a lot of grandeur, with balls and dances and all the pageantry that Britain and France can deploy. So this is a very big moment. But for the Queen, the visit also had a personal dimension. Paris was the home of her uncle, the Duke of Windsor, formerly King Edward VIII, exiled to France after giving up the throne for American divorcee Wallace Simpson. This was the man who had abdicated in 1936, and the abdication had really shaken the monarchy. It was a dereliction of duty. It was the worst thing for the monarchy in the 20th century and it had defined and shadowed the reign of the Queen. As the Queen prepared for the state visit, her uncle was dying of throat cancer. Here we have a letter from the palace to the British ambassador in Paris saying, please make sure there is time in the Queen's schedule for her to visit her uncle, the Duke of Windsor. On the assumption that His Royal Highness and the Duchess are going to be in Paris during the visit, the Queen would like to pay them a private visit. The Duke of Windsor is very, very unwell. The Queen fully understands this may be the last chance she gets to see him alive. The Queen realized that for the sake of unity, to heal this terrible internecine family rift, that she should make a gesture to the Duke of Windsor at the very end of his life. But for the organizers of the state visit, the Queen's meeting with her uncle was fraught with danger. The embassy and at the Elysee Palace and at number 10, what they're really worried about is what happens if he dies either during or just before the visit. And this causes terrible diplomatic seizures. What we have here is a memo to the Prime Minister explaining all the various options. The reports of the Duke's health are becoming more discouraging. The Duke himself has recently cancelled a visit to Spain. Up to what point can he die without ruining the visit? What it boils down to is he can die some weeks before the visit, he can die after the visit, just can't happen during. Finally, on the 18th of May, 1972, the Queen, together with Prince Philip and Prince Charles, arrived at her uncle's home in the west of Paris and was ushered upstairs to the Duke's private sitting room. It would be a historic moment as the two of them met. The Duke of Windsor he was so ill that his doctor had implored him to stay in bed, and he insisted that he had to get out of bed and stand up and bow to his niece, the Queen. 
He even put on a blazer over his pajamas so that he looked smart for the occasion. And it took all his strength to do that. There he was with tubes sticking into his neck, and he got up and he bowed to her. And it was the most moving moment, really, because he had been bitterly hostile to George VI, her father, whom she had adored. It was, by all accounts, a very emotional moment. The queen was seen to dab her eyes as she left because she knew that was the last she was going to see of her uncle. And it took all his strength to do that. And he then went straight back to bed. And then the queen had a chat with Wallace Simpson. And just a few days later, he was dead. I think this is a significant and rather moving moment. And in a sense, his death releases the Queen from the shadow of the abdication. There was a sense of closure. This is the end of what had been a turbulent period for the monarchy. That was an example of her ability to draw the curtain over the past and to act as a reconciler, a healer. And that's the crucial thing about monarchy, that it should draw people together. And that's what she did. Over the course of her reign, the Queen has acted as a unifying force for the nation. But 40 years after her truce with her uncle, the Queen would be called upon to perform an even more demanding gesture of reconciliation, making peace with a man who had overseen the murder of one of her closest relatives. Lord Mountbatten was Prince Philip's uncle and also a very key player in the political, military, social life of the nation. And he was very close to the royal family. He was, after all, great uncle to Prince Charles, who worshipped him. Every August, however, Mountbatten was off the royal scene, gathering with his immediate family at their summer holiday home, Classybourne Castle in the northwest of Ireland. The whole coast was so remote, quiet. It was blissful. It was one of the most enchanting places in the world. William Evans was Mountbatten's valet for 10 years and remembers his boss's love for the castle and its location. First morning of the holiday, he couldn't wait to get out to sea. Every second that we had was spent out lobster fishing. Shadow Five, my grandfather's fishing boat, was incredibly simple. There were no frills whatsoever and he loved it. India Hicks, Lord Mountbatten's granddaughter, has spoken only rarely about the holidays she spent with her grandfather at Classy Bourne. He would try and get as many grandchildren as possible to come every single day, and the excitement of when the lobster pot was pulled out of the water and you could smell it, that, that Irish smell and the, the salt water and the, the lobsters. But idyllic Classy Bourne is just 18 miles from the border with Northern Ireland, and in 1979, the troubles were at their height. It is extraordinary that just when tension and violence were at their most acute, Mountbatten still did his summer holiday in Ireland. All the family tried their best, but there was no way they would stop him going to Classic World. August the 27th, 1979 was a glorious day. Mountbatten and his extended family, including his daughter and twin grandsons, set out on Shadow Five. But just as they reached open water, tragedy struck. My brother and I were at the castle, and we actually heard the bomb go off. We saw the police rush back for their binoculars. There was utter mayhem. The bomb was placed in the decking just under here, which is just close to where the steering wheel is. This is exactly as the Shadow Five would have been coming out of the Black Rocks. Lord Mountbatten's on the wheel. And up above is the coast road, where the terrorists were waiting to remotely control the bomb, blew it to smithereens. 
And of course, there was nothing left. Lord Mountbatten, one of his twin grandsons, 14-year-old Nicholas Natchbull, and a 15-year-old crew member, Paul Maxwell, were killed. Another passenger, the Dowager Lady Braybourne, died the next day in hospital. It would be hard to define a more cowardly attack in the annals of high-profile terrorism than to blow up a, a grandfather with his children out fishing on holiday. The Queen was at Balmoral when she received the news of Mountbatten's death. The twin who was not killed later came up to Balmoral and he arrived late at night and the whole house was shut up and the Queen rushes down the corridor to greet him, to sort of, you know, enfold him, if you like. And that's a side of the Queen we don't often see. My Batten's death hit the royal family really hard. I mean, he was very close, particularly to Prince Charles and to the Queen. The day of my grandfather's assassination, you know, of course, is um, uh, embedded in my memory. I was lucky that I was at an age where I was able to get all of the emotion out. And so I am possibly able to look at it more in the eye than other members of my family um, who have never recovered. 19 years after Lord Mountbatten's assassination, the Good Friday Agreement brought the troubles to an end. Martin McGuinness, an IRA commander at the time of Mountbatten's murder, would become Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. From childhood, the Queen has known that duty comes first. It trumps everything else, whatever your personal private feelings are. Duty calls, and it may be that you're not feeling very well and you don't want to do something. Or it may mean you've got to shake hands with someone who murdered a member of your family and tried to kill you. He was second in the receiving line and it lasted for just a moment. Extraordinary nevertheless. The British sovereign and the former IRA commander shaking hands. She showed magnanimity and astonishing political savvy in shaking hands with Martin McGuinness, the man who was probably responsible for the death of Lord Mountbatten. Two years later in 2014, the Queen invited Martin McGuinness to Windsor Castle for a state dinner in honor of the President of Ireland. As head of state, she is constitutionally bound to do what the state wants her to do. And if the state wants her to bury the hatchet, then that is what she has to do. We'll never know probably how privately she felt about it. Private grief is not allowed to trump public need for a political reconciliation. She has embodied the whole business of reconciliation in her own person. And that is really quite something in an age where old hatreds are extremely difficult to extinguish. Over the decades, the Queen may have mastered the art of diplomacy, but mastering her own family has always been more of a challenge. I do not know how the Queen coped with all those catastrophes. Or if you think it's her evilest now, just you wait. Year of celebration, marking 40 years since Elizabeth became Queen. Instead, it would become one of the most challenging years of her reign, when her skills as monarch and mother would be tested to the limit. 1992 was extraordinary. It was month after month, every month, a different scandal. It started in January, those pictures of Fergie and Steve Wyatt. Anne and Mark Phillips announced that they were to divorce. Divorce? Very much. Never been mentioned. Then there was the tour of India that was supposed to mark a reconciliation, and instead we saw Diana photographed ostentatiously alone. Andrew and Fergie split up. She's been accused of extravagance, bad taste, and an over-exuberant manner. The Squidgy Gate tapes, late-night conversation between Diana and her lover, recorded and broadcast to the nation. 
It was like slap, slap, slap across the face of the royal family. I mean, it just didn't stop. And the paparazzi were out there trying to get the photographs to go with all these stories. Fergie is photographed having her toes kissed by her financial advisor. Papers say the pictures show the truth about his relationship with the Duchess. What is your exact relationship with the Duchess of York? Could you tell me that, please? And they were all at Balmoral when the news broke. And the Queen had to come down to breakfast and see them all reading the papers. Some of the stories were really things you wouldn't have wanted to discuss much with your own family, let alone with the head of state. The Queen herself is reported to have said to a friend, where did I go wrong? One event did more than any other to shatter the picture-perfect image of the royal family, a biography of Princess Diana by journalist Andrew Morton. There was a huge build-up to the Andrew Morton book, and I had an idea of what was coming, but not quite sure what the scale of it was going to be. We were told to batten down the hatches and try and deal with it as best you can. But how do you deal with something that is there in print? The book contained astonishing, intimate revelations about Diana's married life. Diana had spoken via an intermediary to Andrew Morton about the horrors of her marriage, about the coldness of the royal family, about everything that you would never, ever in a million years expect a princess to talk about. It went crazy, it was in Parliament, it was discussed in every television programme. He was stories about Diana throwing herself down a flight of stairs in front of the Queen Mother, about bulimia, about unfaithfulness in the marriage. Royal advisers love to control as much as they can. Suddenly, here was evidence of a total loss of control. That was the real earthquake behind Morton. The problem that the Queen faced was that the younger generations of royals were not adhering to these high standards that she herself had set, and therefore she was being undermined. In the 1980s and 90s, managing the succession of family scandals would become one of the Queen's biggest tests of judgment. The Queen's style has been laissez-faire, sometimes I thought too laissez-faire. There were many times when I was working for Princess Diana when I wished that the Queen would intervene more. And I think there were times when a bit more direction from above could have produced a much happier result. Sir Martin Charteris, who was her private secretary, said that the Queen could judge when things were going badly and she worked to try and put them right. Not so good in taking initiatives, in doing something new. The Queen may have taken a hands-off approach to her family troubles, but later in 1992, she would face a disaster where she could do little more than react. I remember it was a Friday morning, and I got the call that there was a small fire at Windsor. I got a call from a local radio station at about quarter to 11, asking about the fire. And I said, what fire? And I didn't know anything about it. And I jumped in my car and got there in 35 minutes. And there were already something like 400 media outside. From five miles away, you could see smoke, and you could actually see flames from about a mile away. It was, it was horrific. I was probably the first BBC reporter there, and, I, and, and it was just astonishing to see this seemingly impregnable building in flames. The fire began in the north wing when an unattended builder's lamp set fire to a curtain. What started as a fire in a small private chapel it soon spread to some of the most famous, famous rooms where some of the most important moments in modern royal history had happened. At one point, there was this extraordinary scene of soldiers, castle staff, cleaners, cooks, all passing Leonardo drawings, carpets, vases, priceless items from hand to hand just to get them out of the path of the fire. The only member of the royal family who was in residence at the time was Prince Andrew. A shock and horror in the fact that it took hold so quickly. 
Her Majesty was shot. The Queen arrived to see the house which she'd grown up in, the place with so many memories, the place from which her family take their names. And there it was, going up in smoke. At one stage, you thought, well, they've dampened it down. And the next thing, the Brunswick Tower, right over in the northeast corner, was like a chimney with flames shooting out. The massive salvage operation helped save most of the priceless furniture, but the fire had destroyed over a hundred rooms. The Queen was devastated by it. You could see it in her face. The emotion was something palpable. You don't often see that utterly depressed look on her features. There is a photograph of her while the fire rages, this castle that she has loved. And she's standing there, this small figure in a raincoat with a hood put up over her head. What a terrible blow, personally, that must have been for the Queen. She must have felt, I'm a custodian of this place, and, and I, I failed in my duties. In the evening, I drove along the M4 on the way back to London, and the flames seemed to be 200 feet high, which you could see from a couple of miles away. And it seemed like the end of the world, the metaphorical end of the monarchy. Four days after the fire, the Queen delivered a speech at the Guildhall in London. It was being made to mark her jubilee, but at the end of a year of scandal and disaster, it became a plea for understanding. She had a very bad cold, and she'd also breathed in quite a lot of smoke. She was having some difficulty speaking, and she said to her private secretary, I, I think I, I'd really rather ask the Duke of Edinburgh if he could deliver this. And her advisor said, no, look, I think you need to make this speech. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. It's a speech that's remembered for two words in particular. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. Or to transpose it into the sun's charming argo, one's bum year. And I think she felt those two words really summed up the year that she'd been through. I sometimes wonder how future generations will judge the events of this tumultuous year. I dare say that history will take a slightly more moderate view than that of some contemporary commentators. I think that was another rare moment where you saw the vulnerability of this woman. She may be monarch, but she is still, underneath it all, a woman who feels and, um, and hurts just as we all do. I think everybody realised, yes, of course, various members of the royal family have made mistakes, things have been done that shouldn't have been done. But that speech and that moment summed up, this is a human institution. And it did have that effect of turning things around. But five years later, the Queen would face an even greater tragedy that would shake the monarchy to its core. The country was desperate for some sign of grief from this royal family. I think it's disgusting that they have not appeared or said a word. It was a very dangerous time, I think, for the royal family. On the 31st of August, 1997, the Queen was at Balmoral on her annual summer holiday when she was awoken in the early hours of the morning. We have reports from Paris the Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. They were apparently being pursued by paparazzi on two motorcycles. In terms of the death of an individual, it was perhaps the biggest story in the world since Jeff Kennedy's assassination. And it just was astonishing how many people seemed to be personally affected because she had been this universal, much-loved figure. Diana's death shocked the world. 
But rather than rush back to London to lead the nation in grief, the Queen remained at Balmoral. Well, I can remember I came up to London, and when I got to the top of the Mall, I realized that Buckingham Palace was totally shut. There were no lights, there was nothing. And yet all these thousands of people, very quietly, had come there, and there was nobody at home. There was no information coming out. They weren't briefing the press, they were just kind of on lockdown, there was no information. Clearly, the country was desperate for some sign of grief from this royal family, who just seemed to be carrying on as normal. For the past five days, most of the royal family, including the Queen, have been 521 miles away at Balmoral, leaving the palace empty with no flag flying. People wanted to see the Queen. Where's our queen? Where are you, ma'am? Where's our flag? Speak to us, ma'am. Your people need you. Show us you care. Very, very, very disgraceful, I find their behavior. Very disgraceful. What do you think, madam? I think it's disgusting that they have not appeared or said a word. I think it's a disgrace on the whole royal family. It was a very dangerous time, I think, for the royal family. It was perhaps the single clearest moment in her reign when she and her people were at odds. But since Diana's death, the real reason for the Queen's silence has become clear. That week after Diana died, the Queen, I think probably rightly, decided to stay in Balmoral to look after the boys because the boys were her prime concern. They were very young, 12 and 15, and they'd lost their mother in the most horrifying of circumstances. I mean, the most horrendous tragedy for any family, but to have to play it out in the public gaze, she decided to keep the family very private and put her family first. In Diana's death, you saw a tragedy hit a family. They may have been royal, but they were just a family. Prince William and Prince Harry looked uncomfortable in front of the cameras, but this was their first opportunity to read for themselves the touching messages left for them by a grieving public. I think that outpouring of grief and shock took the royal family hugely by surprise. Certainly, I think the Queen was quite shocked and didn't really know how to deal with it. More than any other tragedy of the Queen's reign, the death of Diana was a conflict between her two roles. On the one hand, there's the public grief, and the Queen is expected to lead that. And on the other hand, a really terrible, traumatic tragedy for her as a private individual. And these two things meet in a way that they hadn't met before in her reign. Finally, five days after Diana's death, and as public anger was reaching boiling point, the Queen returned to London. There we see the Queen leaving North Holt now Airport on the way down from Balmoral. To me, the most significant turning point of the Queen's reign, and I was there covering it for, for the BBC live, was, was, was the day that she returned from Scotland. Wesley, what is the mood outside Buckingham Palace at the moment? It's, it's an extremely sombre mood and a very sombre scene. That There are literally thousands of people here. She did two extremely significant things, one of which amazed me, which was that the car came down Constitution Hill with her and the Duke, and the car stops outside the gates of Buckingham Palace. It looks as though the Queen is about to, she is, she's getting out of the car, Wes, and is going to talk to people. It's extremely unusual. This is, this is, this is almost unprecedented. I, I, I think perhaps the last time that the Queen was among her people outside the palace was, was the day the war in Europe ended. That was a very bold example of personal leadership to go out amongst those crowds. Actually, nobody knew what the reaction was going to be. Those of us who'd been in those crowds for a week knew that the crowds were quite hostile. And then she goes up to somebody in the crowd who hands out a flower to her 
and the Queen says, would you like me to put that with the others? And the woman says, no, it's for you. And from that moment, the sort of crowd flips and it's no longer the hostile crowd that it has been. The Queen had won over the crowds, but now she had to win back the nation with one of the most significant speeches of her reign. The speech was delivered live. It wasn't pre-recorded, as most of her um, television appearances are. I happened to hear her doing the one run-through and then straight into the speech, live, at a moment of very, very high emotion. The reason that the crowds were the shot behind, they only had one camera, and they said, well, let's have the crowds behind. Like anyone of my age, I have seen the Queen speak so many times, and she has a way of speaking that is very, in a way, rather formulaic. But when she spoke after Diana's death, that for me was something completely different. What I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. She'd chosen absolutely the right words. To, to say that she was speaking not just as the queen, but as a grandmother, it automatically made you understand why she, we hadn't seen her that week, because she had been looking after her grandchildren, those two grieving boys. She managed to um, convey um, a sense not just of the national tragedy, but also of the private grief that the royal family was going through, and that's why the speech worked. I thought it was a grandmother speaking and not a queen. I was quite moved by it. She sounded very sincere, and she looked as though she was very moved, and I think that would satisfy everyone. Well, I thought she said everything she should have said. I can't think of anything that she left out at all. What I thought was very striking being there that day was that she brought the country together. So I think with the Queen there is very, very powerful personal leadership. Diana's death marked a turning point. And in recent years, the royal family has become more open about publicly expressing emotion. In 2017, Prince Harry gave a remarkable interview. So, Hazza, <laughs> how are you today, really? Today, I'm OK. I'm a little bit nervous, a little bit tight in the chest, but otherwise fine. Speaking to a newspaper podcast, he talked for the first time publicly about the emotional impact of his mother's death. Losing my mum at the age of 12 and therefore shutting down all of my emotions for the last 20 years has had a quite serious effect. And actually, all of a sudden, all of this grief that I'd never processed started to come to the forefront. I was like, there's actually a lot of stuff here I need to deal with. In that interview, Prince Harry was incredibly candid. To hear him admit that it had taken him the best part of two decades to cope with the grief of losing his mother, to hear him talk about coming close to the point of a complete nervous breakdown. This was absolutely extraordinary. But it was 20 years of, of, of not thinking about it and then two years of total chaos. Quite hard to believe that such a senior member of the royal family would be speaking so openly. for a century or more. The royals have been stoic about emotion, but what we want from our royals is changing. The youngest generation are very aware of that, and that really shows how far the royal family's come. In the future, it will be William and Harry that the nation looks to in times of grief and tragedy. The nation has always had a place in its heart for both of those boys. <laughs> Having gone through such a personal tragedy, I think that resonated with people. Anyone who's suffering tragedy themselves can feel that princes, William and Harry, understand because they have been there themselves and they felt the pain just as anybody else would do. I think William and Harry both inherit different qualities from, from different family members. 
So William has got a bit of his grandmother's and his father's stoicism. Harry's hilarious. Welcome to Canada! He's his mother's son. He's very warm and he's, he wears his heart on his sleeve. The Queen and members of the royal family are part of an institution that was going long before they arrived in the world and will still be there long after they've left the world. And I think that gives them a very unique perspective on the things that go wrong in life. I think you could do a lot worse than those four youngsters leading the new generation. Next time, we examine just what it takes to hold the very top job. She's got a great personality, very much a character. The Queen's discretion is her secret weapon. She very, very, very seldom puts, puts a foot wrong. The Queen puts up with many different people, but Ceausescu was too much for her. <laughs> she made it quite, quite plain. She's always going to be the most important person in a room, but she doesn't have a sense of importance. One of her favourite jokes is if a if phone goes off, she says, oh, that must be somebody very important. <laughs>